Good morning. All right. Good morning. 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 Good Everybody jump up and wave your hands around. Okay. We're so Wake up. Okay. Did everybody get coffee and I almost said bagels and then uh, muffins before we start? Just okay. Uh, if you can forgive me, I'm going to have to read this to make sure I get all the right. Uh, first, my name is Aaron. Good morning. Hi, Aaron. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming out. Bright and early is put on by Atomic Dust, a brand new web design and digital marketing agency that's uh, actually located just down the street next door. Uh, for more than two decades, we've used design and design thinking to help businesses overcome challenges and grow. We love fostering and the local creative community and are excited to talk about ways professional small industries can grow with their creative confidence. Uh, secondly, I want to give a big thanks to Work and Leisure and Jordan. Uh, thanks for opening this space for us today. Uh, anybody here that's looking for an event coming up, or event space that they need, uh, Jordan's great to talk to, you can talk to him about it. Uh, he said he'll do it for free, too. <laughs> that's a, that's a joke. Uh, so I want to introduce to you one of my friends I've known for over five years now, I've worked with him in a number of capacities. Uh, Manuel Herrera is an educator, excuse me, an illustrator, and an international speaker. Visual Anchor is now currently working as a success manager for Adobe. Uh, those are the people that make all the programs that allow us to use. So, um, he's keynoted, presented, and facilitated both in person and virtual workshops at educational conferences across the country and specializes in remote learning, visual thinking, and creative problem solving. So, he's going to be talking to us about all of that stuff today. So, without further ado, my friend Manuel Guerrero. Thank you guys. Um, it's, it's interesting when, you, when I said we, we have an international speaker on there. Uh, it's because I presented in Mexico. <laughs> I, you know, I, I talked to other people who presented before, and they said, no, man, you can list an international speaker because you've been to Mexico. And I was like, fair enough. Uh, but I'm excited. I, in the fall, I get to go to Poland, which, again, yeah, yeah. we'll see how that goes in the fall. But I guess a little better about having an international speaker listed, listed as that. So thank you guys for being here. I hope it is bright and early. At 7.30, I think me in education, our teachers would kill us if we asked them to be here at 7.30 and not pay them. So uh, I do, do thank you guys for being here. Uh, I do want to thank these two, Blaze and Aaron, for asking me to be part of this. This is a really cool opportunity for me to do this. I typically do speak in front of teachers and educators um, and students. So, but you know, you're just a different version of those for sure. So thank you guys for both for asking me to be here. Uh, today, my, my, my short talk is a Drawing in your confidence. We're going to talk about how I use that, how I work with teachers, how I work with students, how I work with adults in using drawing, um, which is something that's just kind of innate in all of us when we were children. Some of us may actually still kind of use that now. Uh, but just how that is part of the creative process, how that builds confidence in ourselves, uh, and maybe even tap back into that if you're not doing it anymore, if you're not, it's not part of your creative process. I'm just going to give you some ideas of the way that works. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to start with a quick story about this. Uh, and how this kind of came to be. I, I've drawn my entire life since I was a kid. I was a kid in biblically class. Chances are, probably some of you were too. Uh, but I was the one that always got in trouble. So even as an educator, I got in trouble as, like that as well. Um, I would draw with kids as a way to kind of comprehend information. So teachers would tell me that, no, you can't. Other teachers would tell me, you can't do that with kids. That's, that's not how we take notes. So I kind of put the crayons back in the box for quite a while. My first probably 10 years, I stopped doing it because teachers were you know, shutting me the way teachers did when I was a kid. Uh, but probably about eight years ago, uh, I was working at a high school here uh, in St. Louis, I was at the high school. My role there was the technology coordinator. So really what, what my job was, was I was a guy in the district who traveled around, who knew how to use technology, and was to teach teachers how to use technology. So it was a really fun gig, so they put me in this room at the high school and gave me all the stuff that kids could use to create all the digital tools. I had 3D printer, or digital tools, physical tools. I had 3D printers, laser etchers, laser cutters, poster printers. I had no uh, creative speed on all my computers. I had GoPros, I had tripods. So all the stuff that teachers tell kids to use to go be creative, right? And so the kids would periodically come down to my room, and then this, on this day, these kids came to my room and they said, uh, hey Herrera, we need to use your 3D printer. Um, can, can we use it? I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. Come, come in, let's, let's talk about it. I said, you know, what is it you're trying to do? What do you want to create? 
and kind of, they kind of look at each other and, and realize that they really have no idea. All they said was that, I don't know, the teacher in our biomedical class said we have to create a biomedical innovation of some sort and we have to use a 3D printer. And I was like, all right, so what are your ideas? And this kind of mining exercise happens between them. They're like looking at each other, talking. Okay, so like we're going to build this thing, right? It's going to look like it's going to have it. And they're talking and they're arguing. And I said, okay, okay, let's, let's go sit down. Let's sit at the table. We're doing this like at the door. And I said, okay, let's go sit down at this table and let's talk about it. So we kind of go through like, what is it you're trying to create? And so they, they start to talk. And me, naturally, I grab the marker, dry erase marker, and just kind of started to scribble what I thought they were trying to come up with. Probably after two or three minutes, we come up with, I come up with this drawing. No big reveal, nothing fancy, just a simple drawing. But what was really interesting was that the kids started to like, yeah, okay, yeah. And then all of a sudden I became the, you know, the note taker for the group. But eventually the kids grabbed their own markers and started to contribute to the drawing. And we came up with several drawings. And I was like, okay, there's something here. Like, this is, we're drawing again. I'm drawing again. Like, I, I'm, I'm finding some joy in this. And so that, that, that group of kids leaves. And I said, okay, um, you know, so the next group, the next group comes. Same exercise. We want to build this thing. We don't know. And so let's go to the table. We draw. And probably after about the fourth or fifth group that comes through, they start bringing drawings. And because the work gets back to the classroom, that Herrera is going to make you draw. He's going to make you draw something. And so it was kind of nice, like, okay, something, this is, this is working, this is effective. Kids are naturally communicating, kids are naturally collaborating. These are the, you know, the buzzwords that we use in education, yet we have a hard time understanding what that means because we're trying to prepare our kids to work in the workforce. So I started to think, okay, I want to use this one, I want to bring this back in. And so Again, with my role, I travel to another classroom. We start to use um, voxels from Pixel Press here. That's kind of how I got here. And the kids were making uh, video games using this app called Voxels. And beautiful games, amazing games, uh, video games that kids could make within minutes. And what I found was that the games didn't make any sense. The characters didn't make any sense. There was no storyline. And as a kid who played video games, it kind of, kind of still does. Um, you kind of need those things, right? I, and I know there's like a discovery point where kids are just learning how to use the app, right? But this wasn't like really truly what I thought creativity could be. We were just excited that they would make something and they would do something and we could post it and feel really, really good about ourselves as educators because our kids are quote unquote creative. So we started to really just do this, just use drawing as a way to think through characters, as a way to think through ideas, as a way to think through storylines. And it kind of just kept snowballing. Now kids are coming in and I'm starting to use this dry erase wall that we had in my classroom, which is just shallow where they walk from Home Depot and it's Velcro to the wall. And kids started to really kind of take hold of this. This is a student just designing a video. We ask kids to create videos in our classrooms all the time. We don't help them with video production. We just say, go and be creative. And so this is just, I mean, you know, this is just my mind, right? But it's watching the kids do this and learn skills that likely will be in the workforce in some capacity because the tools will change. They're going to use something different. They're not always going to use the tools that we have. So I really like kind of emphasize when I use drawing is really as a way of as a, as a way of thinking, as a way of um, the kind of the dirty and the ugly and the nasty work that happens behind the scenes. That's what I value is creativity. That's what I try to teach teachers. It's just a stepping stone. It's not the end all be all, but it's a, it's a place to start. It's okay to do that. So um, what it does is it, it brings ideas to life. It allows us to uh, organize complex ideas, and it's a way just to communicate back and forth with one another. Probably likely do that in your jobs every day. So when I, when I talk to teachers, when I talk to you, I just I don't know that I have to necessarily say this, but I want us to stop really thinking about drawing as a as just an artistic process, but really start to look at drawing um, as a thinking process, a way to process information, think it, think through. I know we do, I still do use it as an artistic process. I do have to sort of initial ideas, but kind of as we're working with teams, um, I want teachers to start to use this because this is where uh, we have a lot of confusion in education is that we don't always know what everybody's thinking. We just kind of assume because we have a bullet pointed um, you know, slideshow that we kind of get what's happening. So um, all that to finally introduce kind of myself, kind of who I am and what I do aside from being in education. Um, uh, this is my 19 year, I'm finishing up my 19 year in education. So I say finishing up because I'm going to kind of move on uh, for now. But I've also I've been doing um, kind of these workshops and these talks for about eight years in a variety of ways, from like I said earlier, from kids to teachers to you guys, to art teachers. Um, it just kind of just depends on what's going on. But I've been doing it for, for quite a while and I, and I found a lot of success with it. I just wish my old teachers could see me <laughs> because they were the ones that told me that's art, don't do that. Um, 
I love tacos, I love whiskey, I love ramen. Those were kind of, kind of what it means to eat me. Um, I'm an illustrator and I'm a dad, so I try to do a lot of stuff with my kids. And, you know, I feel bad because I do try a lot of stuff off of with them when it comes to working with kids. Um, and uh, so Aaron had mentioned earlier, I'm going to start to work for Adobe, which I'm really excited about. It's kind of a, kind of a cool thing for me as somebody who was told not to draw to now get to work for an incredibly creative company. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm going to veer off a little bit for a little while anyway. I'll continue doing these talks and these workshops because uh, I love it. I love to do it so much. So um, what I want to do is kind of build some confidence with you. If you're not somebody who draws or you haven't done it in a while, you really don't put pen to paper. Uh, so uh, let's, we're going to start with, uh, we purchased some little notebooks for you. So if you want to grab one of those and some pens, um, we're going to do a couple of things just to kind of, kind of wake up a little bit and, and have, um, kind of see how I use drawing and how maybe you can come back to the drawing. Um, so grab a pen, grab a notebook, and we're going to start with this. I want you to go a body click page, and I want you to create these kind of squiggles on your page. And I'm going to use my iPad here and I'm going to show you what I mean, but it doesn't exactly have to be like this. Just kind of create just some random squiggles. It kind of leaves you space between them. Between them. And you may want to use two on the page. Those are kind of, kind of small little books. This is where I start usually when I try to express like how can we use drawing to communicate, to express ourselves in simple, simple like complex ideas. And usually when I work with kids and teachers and adults, I, I tell them just to have one pen. We don't worry about colors, we don't worry about any of the other kind of things that kind of distract us. But go ahead and draw these. I'm going to change this. I have, I've had a dramatic effect. I'm going to change colors. But you continue with black. All right, so what if I told you that we're going to turn these little, you know, meaningless squiggles into birds? We're going to make these each look like birds, and all we're going to do, and I'm just turning this around just to prove that I didn't set this up, is we're going to add the things that make up a bird a bird. So birds have beaks, birds have eyes, birds have legs. Maybe a fancy you could have decorators. But look at your squiggles. I promise this is going somewhere. And see how you can turn these into these animals. It's funny doing this with kids, because kids will say, oh, that's a chicken. That's what? That's a bird. <laughs> but finish looking at those things around. You can make the legs kind of long, they can look like flamingos if you want. Now I show you this not because I want to entertain you or want just to begin with you, but I show this to you because most of you probably as you're drawing, you drew those, squ those squiggles probably about I don't know, 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds until you draw that. And then I said, okay, we're going to add some pieces like to make it a bird. We did that for another 15, 20, 30 seconds. And all of a sudden, after you on your paper, you have six or seven birds that you drew in less than a minute, 90 seconds-ish. That's kind of how I want us to think about drawing if we're not comfortable with it. Is that it needs to be quick, if you're just trying to get an idea out as fast as you can, because you're trying to communicate something, because I know our minds are definitely faster than our hands. In a worst case scenario, if it doesn't look like what you want it to look like, you can always just do this. And then you're okay. <laughs> the, reason, the reason I say that is because we will get caught up. We will get caught up in the art. You, were, you came in here and said, okay, guys, we're going to open up our notebooks and we're going to draw seven birds. Um, chances are you're like, yeah, right, whatever. Or we would get caught up in the details. What kind of bird? What color? How does it look? We're just talking about birds. Right? And for us in education, we might talk about birds, we might talk about flocks, migration, we might talk about food chains. But for us as, as creatives, we may be talking, just to explain that user experience. We may be trying to explain ideas that, that a client had. But we're just using quick, simple drawings to do that. We're not so caught up. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the purpose of that, and I kind of just do it because if you're not somebody who draws, hopefully it kind of brings some of that joy back to you. The other thing to kind of think, the other thing to think about is uh, that I've learned is I've kind of researched um, using visual thinking, using drawing, learning what graphic reporters do. Um, I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, visual practitioners. Uh, Another thing that they would use to think about ideas is, is kind of a visual alphabet. So I didn't think about um, when we read or when we, when we write, we use letters, we combine letters, letters, make words, and we have sentences. 
So if we kind of think about a visual alphabet um, with ourselves, we can kind of create anything for the purposes of, of communicating if we kind of have this visual alphabet in our head. And what this can look like is something as simple as a dot, being able to draw a line, being able to draw arrows, rectangles, squares, simple things. But if we kind of think of, of ideas or concepts in terms of those, we can turn them into anything. We can combine them together to make more complex, more complex ideas. Um, in education, we can teach teachers to like, okay, look at this, and I can turn all of these shapes into something rather quite simple, because maybe I'm, I'm communicating ideas to kids, and now all of a sudden I have maybe a city scene that I'm working on, because maybe we're talking about rural and urban ideas, but maybe this may, and then actually because I'm on an iPad, I can move this, and now that becomes my moon, this now becomes my set of mountains, but just try to think of things as very simple, not super complex. So think about when you're drawing, to kind of think in terms of like, I'm just piecing together these things or these ideas in order to represent complex ideas. You likely already do that now. Uh, it's just all about not overthinking everything. So eventually what happens is you kind of develop these, this visual library in your head. I, I work in education a lot and I draw a lot of these things over and over and over again. So I'm able to quickly draw a lot of these things. Same thing with you, if you start to use drawing as a way to explain yourself, you'll kind of have some concepts, some ideas, some things, some imagery in your head that you will continue to use and over and over again. So it will become second nature to draw them. Um, it does take time. There are times where I have to go use Google because I know I'm going to be able to talk about something, a specific content area, so I need to go and look up reference images so that I can kind of quickly draw those to help teachers or help kids or whatever it is that I'm um, speaking to. All right, so where are the, where are the, the, the three things that are all part of this kind of my kind of basic pillars of my creative process um, and how I use drawing and how I try to incorporate that into my everyday life. So now we kind of hopefully built some confidence, you're excited about what you're doing, excited about putting paper, pen to paper again. Uh, I kind of revolve around these three pillars, habits, noticing, and playing, just to keep things fresh. Because if you are using drawing, it does get mundane, it does get boring. Um, so I kind of want to explain that. So the first one is habits. How do we form habits around this? How can I integrate this into my everyday? Um, so I started to look into, to kind of achieve these goals. Maybe I want to start to use drawing every time I do a presentation, every time I'm explaining my idea. So I wanted to develop really good drawing habits. Uh, so I, I went and I checked out a book called Atomic Habits. Chances are you might have read it already. Uh, but what I found really wasn't about the necessarily the steps in creating habits. It was more about the mindsets before I even started creating a habit, especially around something like drawing to, to work with teachers. Uh, and in the book, James Clear says it's hard to change your habits if you never change the underlying belief that led you to your past behavior. So for me, it's working with teachers, working with educators, working with adults, it's teaching them to be creative. If they don't ever think that they're creative or they're creative problem solvers, which is a big thing in education, if they don't believe that's who they can be, they're never going to achieve that. Um, and so it's interesting, I, I hate to have charts in the presentation, but here it is. Um, what Jake, what James Peter says, you know, these are the kind of three things that really shape, can shape our habits. We have our outcomes, which are the things that we want to achieve. So I, I want to be a marathon runner. And then the process, or excuse me, I want to, I want to run a marathon. And then our process is, well, I'm going to join a running group, or I'm going to invite some friends out to run, or I'm going to hold myself accountable in the morning and make sure I get up at 6 a.m. to go run 10 miles or whatever it may be. And hopefully in the end, I become this runner. What was interesting is what he said is that if you kind of flip this around and really start with your identity and who you are um, as a person, so you want to, I, want, I am a runner. If I start with that idea, that concept that I am a runner, I am a creative problem solver, I am a creative, work my way out, I'll achieve those outcomes. It's a little easier to do. Uh, I thought that was interesting because sometimes I have to remind myself. I have huge imposter syndrome, I'm sure some of us here as well. So I have to remind myself that I have this identity, that I am creative, that I am a creative problem solver, that I am a presenter, that I am, and then work my way because I'm going to present to you guys, or whatever it might be. So it's really, you know, key, I think, at least it's working for, for me right now, uh, is to start with that identity first. And he gives a few examples, and I use one of them myself, but 
It's not that you want to read a book, it's that you want to become a reader. We always have that, right? That was why I read, that's why I read that book, was because at the beginning of the year, new year, new me, I'm going to read a book. Um, and so that's really what I tell them. If I tell myself, I'm going to be, I'm a reader, that's what I do. I, I, I kind of stuck with that. I grabbed the books and I've read them. And sometimes it's not even to finish them, sometimes it's to read chapters or sections or things that apply. And I've told myself, that is who I am, that's what I do. And so when it comes to being teachers, when I work with teachers, it's, uh, I'm not creative. I'm not a creative individual. I can't be a creative problem solver. All they want to do is create, make creative lessons, but never really truly believe that themselves are um, a creative or a creative person. So that's really what, uh, what I use around habits right now. So definitely look at the book. I'm not going to repeat the book to you, but there's also definitely more steps in there to kind of achieve that. But I, I thought it was important that we start with the mindset, right? If we don't have that, how are we going to accomplish it? So the next one is noticing. So this is, this is, I love this because I do this a lot. I just notice things. I just look at stuff. And it doesn't matter whether it's this, I've already been noticing that. I'm already thinking like, how can I use something as simple as that to kind of you know, be creative? Um, but I'm already thinking of drawings that I can use for that. So Austin Klee on somebody else who I've read, can start you out as well. The way to improve your creative life is to learn to pay better attention to your everyday world. We are constantly obsessed with our phones. I am, you are, go by yourself, we all, we all are. So we forget to look up, we forget to look around, and so it's important to kind of try to keep that. Uh, so maybe you're going to be a noticer, that is your identity, you're going to be somebody who's going to notice things, right? Um, and a good way to do that, and I kind of have to have an activity, um, is if you put googly eyes on it. So on your table, you have googly eyes. Now I did tell Blaze that I wouldn't do this, so I'm not going to do this, but take the googly eyes with you. Because <laughs> I don't want Jordan to get mad at me. Um, but try putting them on things. And just something as simple, as silly, as mundane, as childish as that, just will cause you on your way out, as you walk to your car, as you walk to wherever you're going, to look at the world around you and just see what you notice because you're thinking, I'm going to put googly eyes on it. So I do this with teachers, and I love it because I do it in their schools, and I say, go put this on shit. Go put this wherever. It's not my school. You go do it. And, and it's amazing to see what they do. And they start to notice kind of the everyday and the mundane. I mean, even if I have big enough googly eye, I put them on the clock. It's just something as simple and silly as this. So we have from coffee makers to uh, dispensers to, that was a, the arch is actually a picture that a teacher put it on there. And then draw it. Practice or something. Like, I'm going to practice drawing. I've got to build a visual library in my head, even if it's just the mundane and the weird and the odd things that I see. But now I can go and I draw that. Now I have something that I can, I can scribble in. And then I was just talking to Aaron and Blaze. Aaron brought up this, uh, this, this, uh, this website that had these, like just putting it on food, which is, which is quite interesting. So yeah, do, do this even with food, just with whatever, and then draw. Just gives you something to draw. Put the pencil, pencil on paper, and, and you know, it's some creativity or some ideas might manifest from that. You just never know where you'll be inspired. I got some of these ideas, uh, well, not just the googly eyes, but you know, some other additional ideas from another book I read called The Art of Noticing. Um, it's a really cool book. It's 131 ways to spark creativity. Um, I have it here. I think I brought it in my backpack here. I look through it, but it's only a book that just lists different things to notice. Um, and it, some of them are, are pretty practical. Some of them are kind of kind of out there. We take some time. But um, what's interesting is that he also kind of lists the level of difficulty. So you can kind of get something kind of easy if you want to start and just go out and do. Um, some of the examples might be taking it for a route. I love this, my family hates it. I don't like to always drive the regular way home. I like to go other directions, especially when I first moved here. Um, I'm originally from Texas, and I moved to St. Louis, I've been in St. Louis, I guess 13 years now. And I used to live all the way out, and God, in like the spirit of St. Louis Airport, or whatever that's called, all the way out there. And I used to work in North City. Um, so I would always drive different ways just to get to know the city, just to notice things. I don't think we do that. It's kind of a Sunday drive, total dad thing, I think. But it's a great way to kind of just see the world and see what, what might inspire you. Imagine what someone's thinking. This is kind of weird, but um, imagine if like, you just see somebody, you're on, I don't know, you're at an event or you're in a, in a building or you're something. Just what is that person thinking? I think we kind of naturally do that. Uh, but maybe you kind of just imagine what they're thinking, but then draw it. Draw all those things. Just give yourself some ideas because that may become a character, that may become a client, that could become a lot of different things, but capture them some way. Collect a rock that reminds you of your favorite food, 
pull out the stick that looks like a relative, I thought that was interesting. Um, but for me, I, I just draw what you see. Uh, I, I just like it, it's a great way to capture your world. If you were to use that journal for the rest of the month, like a couple of weeks, just capture your every day. And now you have this journal of your every day for the next week or two. And that's kind of a cool thing to add. And you may stop with that, that's totally fine, but you have this to go back and look. I am not a journaler, I, I hate writing, I still to this day do not. I've tried blog posts, I've tried it, I don't like it, but I'll draw you a picture every day. So kind of consider that again, that's just another way to get your mind going. And then last, playing. Um, I like to play. I mean, putting the googly eyes would be an example of, of playing, but just have fun. Um, we, we don't do that enough, I think. I think we take life too serious. Um, and again, I think also it has to do with our phone. Oh, I'm doing this. Um, it has to do with our phones, I should do this. It has to do with our phones. And we're constantly just obsessed with you know, social media scrolling. And I'm guilty, guilty, guilty. I did start sleeping with my phone in the other room. So that, that's, I'm, I'm on my way to use the college for freedom. But start to play. Just play with some ideas and some ways to do that with drawing um, are some examples that I've used over the past few years. One of them is Inktober. If you've never done that, um, Inktober was my artist. Did his name, um, but he wanted a way to push his creativity. So what he would do is he would give himself prompts every day, a word, and he would draw that. And so uh, in October he puts these out every year. I've probably been doing it for four or five years, I guess. Uh, but I try to like give myself little challenges. So he'll put random words. It could be like stick. And what I'll do is I'm like, ah, everybody's gonna draw a stick. So what I'll do is like, okay, what else sticks? So I'll draw maybe a post-it note with something on it, or I'll. I'll just take it to a different place because I don't want to draw what everybody else is drawing. So it's a small challenge. Then eventually it became, okay, everything I'm drawing for that prompt, I'm going to put it on a note card. And from there, um, I'm going to collect these. And so what eventually happened was my office wall became covered in these note cards. But it was cool because these were all ideas I had that eventually became ideas for something else that I was using. So going back to the driving, the driving between, you know, West County and all the way to North, it's like going through different parts of the city. It, it, it inspired me in the sense that I, get, I need to learn this city more. I don't think I know enough of this city. Living out in West County, this is, I'm sorry if you do, just what I noticed was that that part of the city doesn't know North County or North City. And North City doesn't know West County. So I was like, I don't want to be that guy. So I wanted, I traveled around. So I, I really got to know different parts of the city and appreciated them. So when it came to the note cards, at one point I started to draw things in the city that reminded me of the prompt. And so all that became um, eventually a poster that I created, I drew of the city. And I'll show it to you all if you want to look at it. Um, a poster of the city, that was just an illustration I created and I sold. So all of these things kind of lead to something else, uh, which is, which is um, and, oh, uh, enjoyment, sorry. And then the other one, if you don't, you can always, there's a book, Austin Cleon, or a journal Austin Cleon was created. Um, he's an author, a writer, and an artist. And it's full, it's full of prompts. It's very much kind of like a breakfast journal type thing. You've never seen that. But very interesting prompts, very like not the normal kind of thing. Uh, but it gives you something to do. It gives you a way to practice drawing. Again, all because I like communicate ideas, all because I want to push my creativity, all because I have complex ideas that I need to communicate. Just know that over time, practice makes improvement. Um, we talk about being perfect, but I tell teachers, you know, this is, you don't want to be perfect. You just want to improve. You want to be confident in what you do. Um, and I, I like this quote about playing because these are two educators that I admire very much. Uh, and it's all about conformity. Part of growing up and becoming part of society is conformity. But finding joy is only you can break out of that box and have fun. Kind of giving your permission to do that in your everyday work. Which is going to be interesting because my job now is just me. I'm not remote. So I have to find some other ways to really break out of this box and be creative and have play off of other people remotely. Um, so we'll see. Another thing I do with kids, and I, I encourage you to try this, is, or do this with teachers, is uh, Legos. I like to give them Lego. We all enjoyed Lego at one time in our life. And uh, we use it to explain things. And we give them random pieces of Lego, not the ones they need, and have them explain ideas. And it's interesting because what they're doing is abstract. What they're doing is not a very concrete explanation. So we can share that with kids when we're talking to kids about being abstract. That's a great way to do it. They're naturally doing it. But when we try to teach abstraction to kids, it's very, it's very abstract. It's very hard. So try that. Try explaining concepts and see where that leads you. Um, with teachers, we had I do an activity just about the summer because when we come back to school, we're, we're trying to prepare for the school year. 
Um, this is what teachers come up with. I think the upper left hand corner is, is a concert. The, left, the lower left hand corner was they became a gardener um, on the right hand side of that. And I think the other one was a home improvement. So they got lucky, they got a door. And I don't remember what, what the far right was. But it's something to try. Again, something to just spark an idea, even if it's something stupid and silly. Um, this is the way they create vision tools, not just to keep our, our, our attention, but also to kind of push our, 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 our thinking as well. If that doesn't work, I should have brought it, I didn't, I failed. We can try this with the uh, muffins. <laughs> is explaining something with an Oreo. Like again, taking something that's not even used to typically explain something and explain a concept, explain an idea. Um, just push your idea. It sounds, again, dumb, but it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting to see that. So different people will do different things. Some people will write part of the cookie and spell the words out or spell the word out. Some people will use the cream to like mold things together and create an object that they're trying to talk about. But give it a shot, try it. I encourage you with the muffins, maybe we can do it with the muffins. Uh, and just know that all of this is, is just part of the journey. It's just part of um, where we're trying to get to. It's not, we're not gonna end up with what we need today. We're not gonna end up with what we need in the journal or in the googly eyes or in the, the, the cream of an Oreo cookie. It's really kind of along that way we'll come up with something. And if we forget to do that, we'll get stuck. We'll get in a rut, and these are ways that I use to get out of those ruts. Um, so keep drawing, communicate ideas, uh, bring stories to life, organize complex things, but just, just have fun with it. If you're not doing it, I have to remind myself to get off this iPad and, and do things in all, not always do things digital. So thank you guys very much. Uh, yeah, that was great. I, we have some time, and so I know people probably have questions, and nobody ever wants to ask the first question. So if nobody asks a question, I'm going to probably ask more if I ask a question. Huh? So, <laughs> what did you say? As long as you ask the first question. No. <laughs> but no, seriously, does anybody have uh, questions they want to ask Daniel before we get out of here? We have about 10, 15 minutes. Mike has a question. I mean, I, I really enjoyed your presentation on the your way of thinking. I'm also a father. And I was wondering, is, do, you, do you teach your children the same things? Uh, and do they think you have the coolest job in the world? Well, so, so this is always interesting when with kids. I don't teach my kids, I just do it. Okay. You know, I just do, our kids are really good about copying what we do, right? Like you look at your kid and before you know what they're dressed like. Kind of thing. Um, well, my kids are because I'm not cool enough. But I just do it, I just model it. So one of the things that I, the way I kind of push creativity or kind of just the idea of like, being silly and having fun is my kids are 13 and 10. The 10 year old, this is his last year of elementary, and every year they have um, a trunk or treat. So if you have kids, you guys know what trunk or treat is. The school parks all the cars in the parking lot, everybody decorates the thing. Well, I gotta go big. You know, I'm gonna take big. But I, I, I take an idea and I'm, I'm like using different materials, I'm using all kinds of stuff. And I just, through that, they I think they see the excitement and the joy that I have in it because they kind of will come along and start to do those things. So I don't necessarily always teach them. Uh, I just do it, and, and, and I think when they see it, uh, it's kind of the best part is when I see my kids draw something. They don't like art, but when they do draw, and I see them draw things like I draw things, I'm like, oh, cool, they get it, you know? Or if they're doing a project like at their mom's house, and I get to go see that, I'm like, oh, that's how I would have done it. You know, so I know, like, okay, this is, you know, it's translating, or it's carrying over. Uh, my oldest son thinks I have the coolest, coolest job in the world because he now, well now that I work for Adobe, he does. Um, because he wants to do video editing. And he's like, so do we get Premiere? Do we get to use Premiere? I'm like, when do you get it? I'm like, I gotta start. Let me, let me, let me start with the orientation and I'll figure it out. So that's, in that sense, he thinks I have the coolest job in the world. Okay. Um, what are you doing at Adobe? Are you I am the, what is my title? Product Success Manager, so not really yet. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'll be working with clients who already have Adobe products and basically trying to keep them um, using Adobe products. But what's interesting is that in, in my, my first meetings I've had, my perspective on how the creative process, the other folks on my team don't have that. They all have very much sales experience. And so it's kind of like, shoving things down your throat, whereas like, I'm like, well, no, it's like, how do, how do they use it? Like, how, let's, let's make sense of how this is used. What's interesting is I learned that Canva is a big competitor for them now. Uh, we use Canva in education, and so I'm, I'm like anti-Canva ever since, just for a variety of reasons. But 
understand the creative process and how I can use all the all the tools together rather than trying to get it all done in like one one tool and trying to like hack it together. So I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. And my goal is to hopefully get to get a cool job and you know a cooler job. Just to elaborate on what you just said, I Um, well, I've always used Procreate. Um, I don't know that I get to use it. <laughs> uh, I've always used Procreate. Uh, I usually, I, that's usually what I use. I have started to use Fresco, which is an Adobe product, just when it came out. But now that Illustrator is on the iPad, it'll make Illustrator a lot easier for me to use, just because I, I don't have any formal training in Illustrator. I just know how to use it. Um, but yeah, I use Procreate. I like it. It works for me. Um, again, I don't know how much I get to say that anymore. <laughs> you know, do we? Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll start to use Fresco a little more, which is kind of nice because it's all got their which you might need. I I I I I don't I believe so. I don't I don't know that I have that kind of cloud yet. <laughs> uh, but you know, for sure. Like I think I can bring the perspective of using other digital tools. So I think when they came up was Affinity Designer. I used that a little bit, and that was about a client who wanted to go use Affinity Designer, and nobody on the team had ever used it, and I had used it a little bit, so I kind of understood like, the workflow of how that of how that tool works, so, yeah. I don't know if I know to ask this question clearly, but, uh, <laughs> so, we do, uh, we do a lot of workshops with clients, right, and clients do not typically consider themselves to be creatives in the sense that they can do visual work. And our works, but everybody can be a writer, right? Like you ask our writers, and everybody thinks they're a writer, they're gonna have an opinion, they're gonna say you should change this word to that, but you put some visual in front of them, they get stuck. So do you think, and maybe there's not a yes or no answer to it, but do you think that introducing uh, visual exercises and things like that is potentially a way to get real uh, problem solve in a setting like that with people who don't consider themselves visual people, or do you think it's more of a like a creative loosening up and just getting them to maybe think a little bit differently before we go into or in, in sort of partnership with the writing work we do? I think it's a little both. Um, I, I say that just in working with individuals who are, aren't very visual and somebody who, who is, who just will get whether they're doing it or not, but if you do it, they get it. They, uh, the, team, the people who may not do that, when you kind of bring them along, I still think it's a great way for you all to be kind of understanding what the project is, what's going on, what is happening. Um, I think it's effective because it exists. I didn't know the entire industry, you know, like film it down the road, that's what they do. They, they get clients together and they have somebody who visually explains or captures what everybody's saying in the room, um, just so that everybody's clear on the expectations, everybody's clear on what's about to happen. Uh, I don't know how much, how much Clients are involved in that creative process. It's a lot. It probably just helps you um, as as the creative understand what it is that they want. And it kind of goes back to the kids at the table. Um, they all have ideas and they were all very verbal. But it wasn't until I put it on the paper that they could actually give me more information than I really needed because I was going to be the one helping them to design that. Um, because I found that kids don't like to they like to use a three D printer, but they don't like to design the things that they want to do. You know, they don't like to do the design part. Um, so I don't know, yes, 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 and, and I, I think it's, you can combine some superpowers there to get a better um, understanding of what they want. Um, yeah. But yeah, creative exercises are great. I think people realize, oh wow, I can do this, or wow, I do understand this one now. Whether they're the ones you know, capturing anything, they don't really understand. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was curious, um, I also like, what I don't know if I call myself an illustrator, but you're all the time. Uh, I was curious on your work that you do, um, do you ever have trouble like sort of organizing or like what what's a throwaway item or a keep item type of thing for the future? I, I keep it all, I try to. Um, and whether it's like on well, whether it's on my wall and post-it notes on to the index cards or it's in a journal somewhere. But I just keep it just because it's there. Now if I have to go recall it where it is, yeah, that's it's another it's that's it's another story. <laughs> Um, I try not to throw much away. Um, journals are my best friend. Um, like things like that, I used for a long time. And I still kind of do now. You know, I've used you know, bigger, bigger journals, but I keep it all in there. And sometimes because I drew it, I remember. I'll remember it. Um, 
I mean, I remember where it was journal, but I'll remember that idea of that, um, that. It goes back to that map, and I'll show you the map. Oh, well, actually, I'm going to give the map away. Um, I'll, I'll show you the map. It just, I remember looking at the things. I remember drawing those things. When someone came to time to actually be able to share that map and pull those ideas back up in my head. So I, don't, I know some people use OneNote, some people use Evernote, and that's still a thing. Um, but yeah, I don't have a good way of organizing that stuff. And that's our Achilles heel is one of the great people. So, follow up question. So, are you bummed that your title, Adobe's not going to be Adobe Illustrator? <laughs> You know what? I'm gonna push it. I'll see if I can. I'm actually gonna use it a little bit. You know, I've had I've had a variety of titles in, in education, and this is the latest one for sure. And it's at the coolest, you know, one of the cooler companies. I've been an innovation coordinator. I've been an organizational doodler. I mean, I've had some really cool stuff, titles, but product success manager. You know, that's yeah, that's not as cool. I'm gonna push for the Adobe Illustrator. Oh, so I have, I have a map to get a couple things to get away. I didn't really have to do this. Um, I wonder who drove the furthest because this is really early in the morning. It's got to be right Yeah, my computer is 35 minutes. 35 minutes? Anybody? Isn't that oh, yeah, Anybody beat 35 minutes? Oh, All right, cool. I have a, I have a, I have a picture in there. What's that? That's why I was late. Well, that's it. I should have shunned you. Yeah, thank you guys very much. Uh, I love the chat if you want to hang out. Enjoy coffee, make something with the, uh, the muffins. <laughs> 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 <laughs>